good evening. I would like to welcome everyone to the second installment of the AO North America Trauma Journal Club, where we will be discussing some landmark articles and follow-up articles to management and workup of tibial plateau fractures. This is the relevant disclosures. They've been addressed and there's none specifically relevant to the discussions herein. The format will be two recorded videos discussing the stage fixation of tubial, high energy tubial plateau fractures, where a participant should be able to understand the historical context and see how there are certain situations where staging may not always be necessary. Uh, that will be followed by a brief question and answer session. So please share your questions in the uh, type in forum. And then the second session will be discussing the MRI or MIR, if you're doing it Yoda way, of the tibial plateaus, the workup and how it affects management and outcomes. And similarly, that will be followed with a question and answer session. As always, in Zoom etiquette, keep your microphones muted and off and video unshared until the participant portion and share the questions and answers. I'd like to welcome everybody to this installment of the AO North American Journal Club, where we'll be talking about the stage treatment of high energy tibial plateau fractures with Dr. Eagle. Uh, can you give us some historical perspective? That is, what was going on in 2005 that prompted this study? Well, this I think this study was influenced by the work that had been done by Mike Serkin in Tampa at the time, uh, looking at the staging of repair of high energy pilon fractures and uh, following their publication of a of a stage protocol for treatment of those injuries and the decrease in soft tissue complications, many people started utilizing this approach uh, for other areas, uh, including across the knee. It's not a technique that I developed, uh, but we um, took a look at our results uh, and tried to apply uh, the principles to the knee um, in a prospective way. And this paper uh, was a result of, uh, of that effort. And I, you, you kind of mentioned it, but uh, for tibial plateau specifically, no one had done this before. Correct. I mean, obviously, we know that there are high energy and low energy tibial plateau fractures, and we were focused more on the high energy uh, tibial plateau fractures uh, because of the potential for soft tissue complications um, and, uh, and wound infection uh, following the surgical intervention of these injuries. Uh, what were the key findings? in this stage protocol? Well, uh, you know, obviously we found that the, the use of this uh, algorithm was successful in lowering our complication rate compared to historical uh, controls. I think we had about a 5% deep infection rate utilizing this, whereas before authors had reported anywhere from 15 to 25% infection rates with uh, acute fixation of these high energy fractures. What was interesting is that I remember presenting this paper at the OTA meeting and uh, it brought up a, a pretty robust discussion from the audience, which then spurred me uh, to go ahead and do two other uh, prospective studies off of this study. And that's a good segue into the next question. How has your practice changed as a result? Or maybe you can allude to uh, what those additional studies showed to kind of direct your, your practice in managing these complicated injuries. Well, first, I would say that certainly over the last 15 years, our center, and I think many other centers have adopted this strategy for initial management of these injuries. And I think uh, for what it's worth, I think it's probably the standard of care. I think you don't lose anything by applying one of these uh, bridging external fixators in a damage control type situation and coming back uh, to manage definitively at a time when uh, you feel that the soft tissue envelope is more amenable to that intervention. As far as the other issues and questions that were raised by this. Uh, people brought up uh, during the question and answer session that they felt that putting uh, the fixator on and pulling the limb back out to length would potentially lead uh, 
to the development of compartment syndrome. And so we did a prospective study where we measured the compartment pressures during every stage of application uh, of the external fixator reduction and then afterwards and basically demonstrated that uh, application of the frame uh, did not lead to the development of compartment syndrome. Uh, and the other issue that was brought up was that there was concern that there were, would be a, a potential problem uh, down the road with pin plate overlap. In other words, if your pins, your external fixation pins were in the zone of injury or in the zone that um, would later host the internal uh, fixation um, implants, uh, that potential contamination would lead to deep infection. And so we did a, a study looking at that um, and found that pin plate overlap did not uh, lead to any increased incidence of infection and was not associated uh, with increased infection in, in these patients uh, after definitive fixation. How is this study still relevant? That is, should we be doing it staged always? Uh, and if not, when do you think it's misused or this study findings have been misinterpreted? Well, I'm not sure that they've been misinterpreted. And I, I certainly never say never and I never say always uh, for anything. I think certainly the uh, treating surgeon's uh, clinical acumen plays a role in deciding who would benefit from this uh, protocol. Um, I think what this study and the subsequent studies that I mentioned demonstrate that it, there's really no downside to this approach. Other studies that have come out have demonstrated that the use of uh, bridging external fixation is associated with some diminished range of motion ultimately after a uh, tibial plateau fracture, but it's hard to determine whether or not that is due from the actual application of the frame or because we're putting these on the really bad injuries that would have difficulty with stiffness anyway. So I really see uh, this as having no, no real downside. Uh, of course, you show me any implant, any technique, I'll show you some type of complication associated with it. Of course, we've seen pin track infections and we've seen uh, fractures around uh, some of the pin sites and broken pins and things like that. So obviously there's always a, uh, a risk benefit that goes into a decision-making process for any procedure that an orthopedic surgeon attempts to utilize for a patient in the care of their injury. Are you still doing the, the protocol kind of as described uh, with the anterior pins and the bridging fixator? Have you moved to anterior lateral or lateral or the traveling traction, some of these X-fix styles that other folks are using because of the potential for arthrofibrosis or quad tendon HO? Whether you go anterior or you go anterior lateral, you're still going through the quadriceps. And uh, I don't think it makes a difference. I think what makes a difference is the technique of pin placement. I think you need to be very careful uh, in spreading down through the muscle and using an obturator in the pin in the uh, drilling trocar to make sure that you're not drilling and capturing any muscle fiber and putting that into the bone, which I think can adhere down to the femur. I think if you uh, you know maintain good technique, pre-drill uh, and cool uh, as you uh, go to place the pins. I think that you know also benefits in reducing the amount of pin track infection, pin care afterwards, all of these things play a role. So I don't think the anatomic placement of the pins is as important as the technique of uh, inserting the pins is with re respect to what you were just discussing. If you were doing the study again today, what would you do differently? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I. I think really the, the study that still has not been done is um, you know bridging X fix versus no bridging X fix, and you know whether or not you can just put somebody in a knee mobilizer and leave them and wait until the soft tissues resolve. I think that most people feel that that's probably not the best thing for the injured limb uh, to leave the limb shortened, to leave the articular surfaces maybe significantly displaced and under certain pressure or. I'm not sure, I think it'd be difficult to do that study, but that's kind of, I think, the one thing that really hasn't been done. It hasn't been compared to doing nothing at all. And the last question is, what are your uh, take homes from this classic article for the viewership? Again, I think if you're dealing with a very high energy fracture, number one, if you're not experienced in the management of these fractures and you're taking call, I think it's a, an excellent technique to temporize a patient 
um, and then allow the case to be passed off to someone with more experience in the area. Number two, if you are experienced and you know that the soft tissue envelope is damaged and you don't want to, you're not sure when you'll be able to get to this, it's, a, it's an excellent way to stabilize uh, the patient to allow for mobilization uh, in and out of bed, uh, uh, especially the multiply injured patient uh, who will need a lot of uh, trips around the hospital and maybe some time before you can get them back to the operating room. You know, I think that, uh, again, the use of an external fixator in this damage control uh, fashion really has very little downside. There's really nothing lost from definitive fixation surgically. And I think it also enables the surgeon, uh, giving, it gives them time to go back and plan because uh, these are very, very complex uh, injuries for the most part, and they require intensive preoperative planning. And I think this technique gives you that opportunity to adequately preoperatively plan for what you're going to do uh, in the surgical case definitively. Thank you. I'd like to welcome everybody and thank Dr. Burkus for joining us today. I want to ask what prompted the study? That is, what uh, made you and your partners want to change from the traditional practice of uh, staging most all bicondylar tibial plateaus? Sure, thank you. You know, as I think most of the viewers would know, you know this is a long history, and I think you can uh, group tibial plateau and tibial pylon into the kind of the same uh, mix here, even though this paper was purely on plateaus. Uh, but, you know, as, as everybody knows, uh, the early experience with acute fixation of both those injuries had a high complication rate, high infection rate, uh, wound healing problems, etc. So Mike Shirkin's paper uh, was the first to talk about it with pylons on a staged approach with X-Fix followed by ORF and then Ken Eagle subsequently did a very similar paper on tibia plateaus, and that pretty much led to what most would probably consider the standard of care of, of a staged approach in both of these. And to get very to the answer of your question, I think we felt that we would see plenty of patients who we'd be taking to surgery for the staged approach, and we would look at them and look at their leg, and none of the reasons for doing the staged approach were present. You know, for whatever reason, they, they weren't very swollen or uh, they had just moderate swelling and no blisters. Uh, and we'd be sitting there kind of scratching our heads of, well, why don't we just go ahead and fix it and then get into these conversations like, oh, well, if you fix it right away, terrible things are going to happen. And so I think the summary is that, you know, the pendulum maybe swung too far to the staged approach and it became just the default answer for, quote unquote, every plateau or, or every pylon without kind of taking a more individualized approach. And then, you know, we certainly had seen uh, literature from the Vancouver group on the acute fixation of uh, pylon fractures. You know, we started being a little bit more aggressive, and that is actually what led to this, this paper. So how have the results continued to change your practice? That is now two years after the study was published, is that still the same, or is it swung even more towards the acute fixation? Uh, I think it's swung a little bit more. You know, I think it opened the eyes of some of our team. You know, we had a, during that study period, and, and still now we have a team that kind of varies from fairly young practitioners who have only been in practice a few years to a number of more seasoned attendings who have been in practice 20 years plus. And so that was a lot of the selection bias of who got what in that, during that study period. The younger guys were very nervous about taking any chances, if you will, if you want to word it like that's probably not very well worded you, with, with acute fixation uh, because of, you know, what to some extent is the, the dogma of, you know, quote unquote, everything should be staged. And so I think uh, as uh, more of our team saw the results uh, of acute fixation, you know, we talk about these repeatedly in our daily conferences. Uh, you know, we were, we've noticed both on plateaus and pylons that when you do do them early, it's certainly way easier. I don't think anybody would argue with that. But we were also uh, really surprised at, at how many how many times that, that, that almost never did the swelling get worse. Or did we really have the wound problems closing that we might have had worried about going in. So I think as more of the team saw that, they became a little bit more 
open to the stage fixation. We've always been a team that's been fairly focused on cost control. And certainly, you know, the cost differences in the one versus two stage are really quite dramatic, but they can't ever outweigh what's best for the patient or patient safety issues. So it's trying to find that balance. And then, you know, certainly the complicating factor in all this is we don't really have anything objective at all to tell us when, when it is clearly safe to do it in one stage. It's very subjective with wrinkle tests, squeeze tests, blisters, et cetera. So I think that's what uh, many times makes practitioners uncomfortable is there's no, there's no real clear sign of, of when it's okay to proceed in one stage. But I would say we're as aggressive or at least as aggressive as, uh, as we were during the, the study time. And to be honest with you, you know, the, the, the times that we do a staged approach, it's typically either because there's you know, very clear soft tissue injury that's not amenable to early surgery in the surgeon's opinion, or to be honest with you, many times it's just more of a time approach. So it's a case that you might do acutely, but there's uh, four or five other things on the schedule mm-hmm. that day, and you just don't have the three hours or so to be uh, doing the acute OR for the plateau so it gets staged so it can be put on an elective schedule. Any particular pearls you kind of alluded to, some of the things you were looking at for the viewership, a young practice is looking to do more cost-effective and efficient patient care? So, you know, it's a, it's a spectrum, and I think a lot of it comes down to your own experience, but uh, certainly the things that, that allow you to, I think, comfortably go forward acutely is the same criteria that you would use when it's safe to go forward if you're doing it staged. So, I think wrinkle sign uh, is something that would make people uh, comfortable. You know, again, it's the the palpation of the leg and the compliance of the skin compared to their other side. And whether that skin is under tension, whether it's shiny, whether it has wrinkles or not, is typically, I think, the things that people will go by. For most people, if there's any blistering, uh, that would be uh, a sign to not proceed. You know, I can tell you there are cases of uh, plateaus and pylons that if there is a very small amount of uh, serous blistering, and it's away from where my incision is going to be. I've, I have an acute uh, fixation uh, without uh, regretting it, but that's probably something that you would want to only do if you uh, really had a lot of experience treating this is- these issues. I don't think I think blistering would probably be a hard should should be a hard stop for most people that don't do these cases in, in a significant volume. If you were to repeat. A similar study or design a new study, what would you do differently? Yeah, that's a good question. And we, and we thought about that. Uh, you know, the biggest barrier to doing a better study in this, I think, is the lack of objective criteria for stratification of the soft tissue. You know, even the soft tissue grading systems we have do not really help you at the low end of the injury soft tissue spectrum determining whether it's, a, whether it's safe or not. You know, I think that one of the com- the comments that came from some of the reviewers is, you know, we, we did stratify based on AO classification and, you know, obviously had C3 injuries, but the, but the bottom line is there's, there's a lot of difference between C3 injuries. There's even a lot of difference between C3-3 injuries. And so that's where it becomes uh, more difficult. So I, I realize I'm not really answering your question. You know, you, Certainly any prospective study is going to be better and you could probably make a list of soft tissue criteria. So blisters, uh, wrinkles, uh, some of those things, and then uh, follow things prospectively would probably be the best way to improve the study. The problem is, and we've we've actually talked about uh, this, you know, for example, to do a prospective study on this in the pylon, which I think is, you know, again, a very, very similar injury and very similar considerations. When we looked at setting up a prospective study, uh, looking at a really deep infection as the, um, as the main you know, variable, it was gonna take, it's been a while since I did this, but something like 400 cases uh, to be, I can't remember if that was 400 to be randomized or 400 per group, because when I saw the 400 number, I knew that was gonna be pretty close to dead on arrival, because not that you couldn't get 400 pylons, but uh, I would, it would be very difficult to convince trauma surgeons to randomize this group to ORIF. I just don't think people would buy into that. I think the people that have done it and have experience of it would have no problem, but there's, there's still a, a very large contingent who that would make them very nervous. 
and I understand that you know there's a lot that, a lot that plays into this if you know if you you know that the potential outcomes of making the wrong decision can be devastating and so I understand that and it certainly is it is the safer decision to do it staged uh, because that's what everybody else does and that's what the literature supports but uh, my personal opinion, based on my experiences, I actually think the complication rate is probably higher in two stage if you carefully select your one stages, uh, mm -hmm. all comers. But that is going to be very difficult to ever prove uh, in a prospective study. Do you have any other uh, parting comments that uh, we didn't hit on specifically? We would hope that this paper would, would uh, challenge people to kind of just be more thoughtful of an individualized approach for patients. I don't know if it's been published yet, but I know uh, Dan Horowitz and his group had a very similar study, but it was older. It was only in the elderly patients, and they found the exact same thing: that the vast majority of these, even bad injuries in elderly patients, could be treated acutely. Now, the energy in many of those patients, even though the X-ray looks the same because of the bone quality, the energy imparted to the soft tissues is lower. So that'll make a lot of intuitive sense to many people. But I think the gist of it is that. You know, make an individual decision based on your patient, what's going on with that particular patient, as opposed to seeing the x-ray and seeing it be a bicondor and just uh, defaulting that automatically that needs to be X-fixed for a stage approach. But again, there certainly are many people that need to be X-fixed with a staged approach. Of course. Great. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Burkus and Dr. Eagle for being here. Uh, I think that we have a couple questions that have come in so far. Um, you guys can go ahead and um, unmute yourself and, and uh, turn your video on if that's all right. Uh, I think both of the questions that have come in so far for Dr. Burkus uh, and his uh, team. Um, the first one is that how do you determine uh, or I guess is the displacement that you see in these fractures, does that help you determine whether or not a patient can have a single stage versus a two stage approach. Uh, yeah, I think it's a factor. Can, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, uh, I think it's a factor. You know, if you see a, uh, you know, two inches of displacement, it should be certainly hitting your radar that that's going to be very high energy, and you need to be uh, giving that some extra thought uh, if the soft tissues, in fact, do look uh, potentially acceptable. Proceed. Um, you know, again, I don't use any, any, any particular one factor, but, um, you know, certainly the, the, the appearance of the x-ray will get my attention. You know, as, as I mentioned in the thing, there's, there's, you know, not all C3s are created equal. Um, and so it's, it's just, it's just one additional factor. And, uh, I, I guess a follow-up to that, now, were all these injuries in your study, were they high energy or low energy or how did you, how did you? What was your inclusion criteria? Um, yeah, if I can, I uh, just closed the, the article by accident. I, I remember that uh, they were all, I believe they were all C injuries, and they were actually like 90% C3s in each group, if I remember. So the, the, the x-ray uh, uh, severity was quite high. And then I think the thing that's at the back of our minds whenever we're going to think about doing something like this acutely, what happens when you get through an operation, maybe it's a little bit more of a struggle than what you anticipated or um, the fluid balance problems or what have you, and you get to the end. I mean, have you ever experienced not being able to close the wounds or what would you do if that happened? Yeah, so fortunately I haven't. Um, like I said, I can't think of a case uh, and either the, the distal tibia or proximal tibia that has not been less swollen when I finished and when I started. Um, now, that said, I have clearly had a couple, uh, you know, I usually close these uh, typically with a sub, uh, subcutaneous stitch and then um, typically interrupted nylons. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the closure, I kind of judge by how, how hard I'm pulling those nylons. I'll typically use 3.0 because... I know if I can close 3-0 when they're not breaking, then I'm not really too worried. I have to go to a 2-0 and I'm tugging on, it gets my attention a little bit. And in those cases, I'll put on an incisional back. Great. 
change over to Dr. Eagle real quick. So I think that it's interesting that um, one of the comments that came up when you were presenting this study at the OTA was that you may be causing a compartment syndrome. Reading through the paper, it seems like there was a pretty significant handful, like 12% of the patients ended up with a compartment syndrome. But reading in the article, it seemed like all these patients were diagnosed preoperatively with the compartment syndrome. Do you remember what the timing was like with that compartment syndrome and how that, that played in? Yeah. Um, the, in the paper, yes, the, the patients were diagnosed with compartment syndrome before we applied the frame. The comment came up at the meeting because people felt that if you took a, a shortened extremity and jacked it out to length, that you'd be creating a, you know, a very tight a compartment that would be prone to develop excessive compartment pressure. And you know, that, that just isn't the case. I just want to go back to something because Walt mentioned it a couple of times and, it, and it's really the key. It's, it's not about the fracture pattern, right? Because we know um, that the elderly can have what looks like a, a high energy fracture pattern uh, secondary to a low energy mechanism. And that's because of the poor quality bone. And that's really you know, what you have, that's, you know, where your decision-making and your experience comes in, understanding that you know, this is a low energy fall in an elderly person with a, that presents with a significantly, you know, displaced, um, higher energy looking pattern. And those are people I think are, are safe to undergo, um, you know, single stage immediate repair. And I do that as well. So I think it's important to make sure that we're all, we're talking about apples to apples and not mixing things up by, by what an x-ray looks like. You know, it's about the energy. So a young person, motorcycle accident, significant condylar widening, ipsilateral, fibula fracture, uh, metaphyseal diaphyseal dissociation, all the factors, you know, Tracy Watson talks about personality of the fracture. That's going to guide you more towards that high energy, you know, be careful of what's going to happen. Because it, it may not happen right when you, uh, you know, you're able to close the wound that night, but then you get the swelling and whatnot, and you might get, you know, skin breakdown and then lead to contamination and, and infection. So uh, again, you know, you, you got to individualize the care for every patient and it's not, it's not one tool for every single fracture the same way. I guess maybe open this up to both of the authors. Do you have a preference for one incision versus two incision for compartment fasciotomies or uh, has that changed over time as well? Because I think that in, your, in the paper, you, you had four compartment fasciotomies. I think it was two incisions, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. How do, you, how do you address that these days? Yeah, I, I only do uh, two incision, four compartment fasciotomies for everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, it's potentially a problem um, at the time of definitive fixation. I, uh, you know, I'll usually have plastic surgery involved because oftentimes you'll have to make some kind of extension of the fasciotomy. And then I'm always worried about being able to close it at the joint line and whatnot. And we know there's about a 25% infection rate when people who have you know, plateau fracture with fasciotomy. So those are really high risk patients. Um, and I'm not sure what the right answer is as far as timing of the fixation in those people. Yeah, I think that there are some, some papers that maybe suggest that the infection rate isn't higher, but it still is really disconcerting if you do have a big open wound and you're trying to figure out how you're gonna end up, end up plating that. Dr. Burks, do you have a, a preference for one versus two incision fasciotomies? Yeah, I, I'm with Kenny. I do uh, two incisions. Um, you know, if I'm doing a plateau, um, I'm usually one that's pretty aggressive with my incisions, length, my incision length for fasciotomies. Um, you know, they're usually two foot long incisions. Um, but if it's for a plateau that I'm going to have to fix, I will, I will tend to cheat a little bit. I'll cheat a, um, a little bit more posterior typically on each side, and I'll cheat it a little bit more distal and uh try to do a little bit more of the release, um, you know, by shooting the scissors up uh, subcutaneous. I, now that doesn't mean I'm doing a six inch incision. I don't want to, uh, you know, mislead it still. Uh, and, and, and eventually, you know, you do what you need to do, you know, but uh, I will try to hedge for the, the reasons that Kenny, um, Kenny mentions when you have to fix these things after a fesh out me, it's just miserable. You can just tell in the middle of your case, it's going to puss out. It's just, just so disconcerting. And we've actually gone to, um, you know, I'd rather, I'm, I'm kind of a rather put a, a ring fixer pin in my eye than on a patient, but these are the cases that I still think there's a, there's a good reason to put rings on some of these uh, bad proximal tibias with, with uh, compartment syndrome. 
Dr. Perkins, back to you. There's a couple of questions about tourniquets. Do you use tourniquets when you're fixing periarticular fractures and, and these single stage ones in particular? Um, and has that changed over time? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's changed dramatically. So I, uh, I changed jobs about eight years ago. So about 12 years into practice. And uh, one of my new partners uh, was like, I never use tourniquet. So um, I went to, and played around with that. And uh, it, I'm, it's really astonishing to me sometimes how much I think the tourniquet will cause swelling. Uh, so when I'm doing these acutes, I almost never use the tourniquet at all. And if I do, I'll put it up for like 15 minutes when I'm like finalizing my joint reduction or inspecting it or something like that. So I can see well, and then I put it down. So it's a really good question. I do think it makes a difference. Dr. Eagle, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I, I tend to do these stage, so I'll always use a tourniquet at the second stage. But I agree with Walt. You know, I, I find that um, doing fractures at risk early, like if, if I happen to do like a low energy peel on and all my ankles and, and such, uh, you know, I will not use a tourniquet um, for, for the wound, potential wounds at risk. Um, you know, if I'm in an area that I'm a little concerned about, like if I'm doing a posterior approach uh, to the plateau or something like that, I'll probably use a tourniquet uh, at least to start. Um, and then, you know, before we close, we always let down. So um, uh, I go either way. And uh, again, if I'm fixing it acutely, I tend not to. Dr. Burgess, I guess one more real brief question. I think that one of the things that uh, I've noticed is the Vancouver group that you talked about a little bit, they have um, they've made pylons and plateaus almost an emergency at their center. Now, are you doing these in the middle of the night or is this something that you're taking the next morning in the trauma room, for example? Um, you're, not, you're not coming in at three in the morning to, to do this sort of thing acutely. Yeah, no way. I'm too old for that. I applaud the Vancouver guys. If you look at that paper, it's something like 30 or 40% of those cases started after like 6 p.m. or something like that. There is no way. Um, so these are typically the next day. And I do think the timing matters. You know, your chance of doing them acutely within the first 12 to 24 hours is way better than uh, 36. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in that, in that Vancouver, that Vancouver paper. I, I, I see, I'm, uh, for some reason, I think there's more, I have more wiggle room in the, in the, in the uh, pylons than I do in the plateaus. I don't know why the, I don't know what it is. I, I do more acute pylons than plateaus, which is not in doesn't make a lot of inherent sense. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer. I, I actually, you know, it's interesting. If you look at our paper, uh, it says there's no statistical difference in the wound comp in the, in the infection rate between the uh, one stage and two stage, but it was uh, 0.06. So we had, I can't remember, it was something like 28% infection rate in the two stage. And I think it was, five in the one stage. So it was awfully close to different. And, and I, and I believe that I, I think I, the same thing, uh, uh, applies to me, uh, in the pylons, um, you know, that the two stage, they take way longer. Those tissues are not normal. I mean, half of the time they're, you know, it's like banging on wood. Um, they're leathery, they're, they're hard. It's hard to retract the tissues. Uh, that's the, the incisions are longer. You're, it's hard to move things around. The other thing I think is really important that, that I don't really see many people talk about this. If you look at the, the surgical techniques that were going on when uh, Kenny's paper came out and Mike Shirkin's paper came out, think of what we did not, or we're not doing regularly, right? Not using a whole lot of two incisions back then. Maybe it was just kind of starting, you know, it was a lot of bigger, you know, one-sided incisions. Um, I think our, our soft tissue technique was different back then. We were probably using tourniquets all the time back then. Uh, no wound vex. None of these other things that we kind of use now to kind of help with uh, all these little tricks we use for wounds wasn't really widely widely established back then. So I think that all those things make a big difference. Great, thanks guys. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to, to join us this evening. It's been a great discussion. So thank you. Thank, thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Right, we'll jump into the second session, please. Remember to keep the questions coming. We'll have them pulled up for when we finish the next round of videos.
thanks for joining us. Thank you. Happy to be here. So going back, looking at this study, it's now uh, going on uh, 15 years in publication. What was some of the impetus for this study? What brought you guys to look at this? Well, you know, I think historically, uh, you know, the treatment of tibial plateaus as a kind of combined soft tissue and bony injury has been a little variable. So clearly early treatment focused on the bony injury, hence led to the Schatzer classification and others. Um, but as uh, techniques and kind of insight into these injuries evolved, people started doing things like a submeniscal arthrotomy to look at the art lateral articular surface, but then also noticed, oh, wow, the lateral meniscus actually torn a lot. And then at a few centers, Pike kind of championed doing arthroscopy and noticed also mainly for articular reduction assessment, but also noticed, oh, this patient has a little ACL, looks to be a partial tear, or postoperatively, the patient's got a little valgus laxity and so there's clearly more going on here. We re and we really don't have a, a standard way to, a protocol to, to diagnose these soft tissue injuries. We don't really have a good sense of the incidence of how often some of the kind of structural soft tissues around the knee are injured uh, in association with soft tissue or with tibial plateau fractures. So briefly then summarize what you guys found in the study then. Uh, yeah, so, you, you know, there were a few main take-home findings, I think. Um, so first of all, you know, I think it's helpful to see it in about 100 patients, 60 of these, all kind of all comers, 62%, I think, were Schatzker twos. So, it, you know, it tells us the majority are these la kind of lateral split depression type. Um, in those Schatzker two type fractures, uh, there's a high in incidence of lateral um, structure, particularly meniscus pathology. Um, also, interestingly, looking at uh, these MRIs where you could see a lot of less displaced fracture lines, there was never a true Schatzker three fracture, which is the kind of pure depression without, a, without some sort of fracture in the wall. So kind of disproved the notion of a, a pure Schatzker three fracture. And then Really big picture, yeah. You, so you see this uh, this table one here of all the injuries, and you just scan down the percentages, and just extremely high. So very high incidence of. Now it's important to remember when we talk about soft tissue injuries, um, it's really important to remember these are MRI. This is MRI signal, and uh, we had a very senior musculoskeletal. MR radiologists uh, grade these, uh, but certainly uh, MR is known to be maybe oversensitive for kind of structurally important injuries. Um, but anyway, uh, at least as far as MRI signal went, a very, just a very high incidence of, of injuries to soft tissues around the knee in general. Great. And then how did this study then change your practice as you did this as a resident and then moved into a fellowship and then into practice. And then I had the uh, privilege of training with you as a resident. How did this change how you approached uh, the tibial plateau fractures that came in to see you? Yeah. So it's, it's interesting, you know, it, it really, I guess it did and still does kind of affect my heightened awareness for the potential for destabilizing soft tissue injuries. Um, when I first started practicing, I uh, kind of tried to get MRIs on most of these patients. And I think the time and the place where this study was done in the mid 2000s in Manhattan um, was different than a lot of other times and places in the country. And I, uh, it's, it's really, in, especially in today's kind of value based healthcare culture and climate, it's really not feasible or warranted, I don't think, to obtain an MRI in every tibial plateau fracture. So it did not change my practice to, um, to, uh, to get an MRI in every tibial plateau fracture. But it really made me more closely examine uh, the soft tissue structures, particularly intraoperatively, once the ORIF component was 
um, completed because it's not, I would say, obvious or routine that we would do a full knee ligamentous exam, for example, on every tibial plateau fracture. And interestingly, you know, I, as I would kind of thoroughly examine these after fixing a plateau fracture, I didn't find a lot of clinically, at least detectable to my exam, um, you know, clear ligamentous injuries. And certainly there are some, and I think it's important to recognize intraoperatively so that you can do something at that time. Sometimes it's even put on an external fixator or leave on an external fixator. Uh, but, I, it, but it also demonstrated to me that probably these MRI findings of MR signal, example of like, um, here on this, it's like popliteal uh, fibular ligament tear, posterolateral corner injuries, you know, 50% incidence of, of rupture, but this didn't lead to clinical problems that we were seeing. And similar to a lot of, a lot of these things that, you know, we kind of called everything partial PCL tear. So the problem is, what do you do with this information? And, and so I, it helped heighten my awareness, but it, it didn't really change my um, approach to detection, which remained really clinical diagnosis, either intraoperatively or by patient symptoms subsequently, feel you know sensations of knee rotatory instability or laxity or anything like that. And we just don't see that that often. And you know, I think the main reason for that is when we have a tibial plateau fracture, particularly the more severe type, um, there's a large inflammatory response, there's a large hemarthrosis. We're fighting stiffness, um, uh, you know, through the post-operative course. So these patients really tend to be stiff. And so I think some of these partial tears, like, you know, PCLs and postural corners, even MCLs, uh, they, they don't result in frank instability or laxity of the knee, you know, once the recovery is complete. So with the findings of this study and maybe some of the other literature that's come out, um, for certain fracture patterns, will you always make a submeniscal arthrotomy? Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. Um, so I think it's warranted to do a submeniscal arthrotomy in pretty much every tibial plateau fracture with kind of clear intraarticular lateral sided um, involvement. Um, I think so in the kind of Schatzker two or any any pattern that has an associated little split depression on the lateral side, you're kind of obligated to um, to examine the lateral meniscus. It's very commonly evulsed from the lateral capsule. We wrote another paper, I think, the subsequent year, kind of uh, correlating the 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 distance of displacement of the lateral wall. And the further it was displaced, probably somewhat intuitively, the higher the incidence of uh, lateral meniscus tear. So I think you're obligated to do submeniscal arthrotomy. The other pattern is what kind of falls best under the Schatzker four, but a fracture dislocation of the medial side where the majority of the lateral tibial plateau is intact and the lateral wall is intact. So if you were to do an, an anterolateral approach, you wouldn't find a clear fracture line to get into the joint, but the whole lateral plateau has displaced from under the distal femur, and it almost always has a vulse the lateral meniscus, which is often punched down into the kind of the central lateral plateau. So that's another one where you wouldn't go to the lateral side necessarily for the articular injury, um, but the lateral meniscus is almost always torn. So yeah, the submeniscal arthrotomy is one, you know, I think of valgus stress, another Another kind of soft tissue issue is, you know, the, the mechanical concept that in order to have a valgus load on the knee that leads to a lateral impaction requires an intact medial side as a hinge or a fulcrum. And we found that that's not true. So you can absolutely have a lateral plateau fracture and MCL laxity. And so uh, again, we don't always treat that with direct MCL repair. But I think it helps counsel the patient. Maybe you use a brace afterwards. So I always do kind of a valgus, a valgus, various and valgus stress really for the ligaments uh, postoperatively. Great. Do you think there's anything that you guys would do differently if you uh, were to redesign the study today? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think, um, you know, we fought with the reviewers a little bit. Um, 
and kind of rightfully so from their perspective on the clinical correlation of of all of these findings, similar to what I, I've kind of mentioned earlier. But you know, there, I think the real deficiency uh, of the conclusions is that there are no there's no clinical outcomes, and what the natural history of these MRI findings is clinically, we don't know that. And and again, our sense is it's not nearly as severe as these high percentages might indicate. So I think to be a little more clinically useful from a study design perspective, we, you know, we might have followed these patients clinically for and see if they have any relevant, um, any relevant ligament injuries. Great. Something that not only find clinically relevant for uh, certain fracture patterns to be aware of the soft tissue injuries, but it's also commonly tested uh, on in trainings and board exams and things like that too. So really appreciate you joining us today. Totally. No problem. Thank you. Steve, thanks for joining us. It's uh, good seeing you again. Um, so the study that we're talking about is this uh, tibial plateau MRI study that uh, I think you were working on when we were in fellowship together, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, so tell me a little bit about the study. Why did you guys uh, and the, uh, the rest of the team, why did you take on this study? Yeah, so, um, you know, this study was born out of a lot of ideas from Dean Lorch, who is uh, one of my mentors in residency. And, uh, you know, this topic, along with a lot of other topics, he really uh, strived to find a better way to, to treat patients and uh, try to push the envelope on clinical outcomes, uh, especially in kind of midterm follow-ups. And so with tibia plateau fractures, you know, he had done some work uh, previously um, kind of showing a high incidence of some of these soft tissue injuries based on MRI. And I think um, the, the main question here is uh, the clinical significance of that. And so um, it was uh, fairly well established that uh, patients with these tibial plateau fractures have a lot of other associated injuries with uh, the menisci as well as the collateral and crucial ligaments. Um, but do these need to be treated uh, to affect and influence patient outcomes in the midterm? And I think that was his main question um, is how do we use this information? Is it relevant to uh, treating patients with these injuries? And, uh, you know, cut to the chase a little bit. What did you guys find? What were the main uh, takeaways from the study? Yeah, so overall, um, we confirmed the high incidence of soft tissue injuries that others have, uh, have described. Um, and in general, um, uh, the lateral meniscus tears were, were routinely uh, treated uh, with the exposure to the submeniscal arthrotomy uh, for uh, lateral articular involvement. Uh, but other uh, injuries like medial meniscus tears, uh, MCL uh, ruptures, and other uh, soft tissue injuries were not routinely uh, addressed during the initial surgery. And with that uh, um, sequence, there were a uh, very minimal effect on clinical outcomes based upon what we saw at a minimum of one year. Um, in addition, uh, one, only one patient had a secondary soft tissue uh, surgery in the, uh, in the follow-up period, suggesting that uh, um, these patients, when their soft tissue injuries were addressed, uh, did not need any additional uh, injury to address them in the future. Yeah, I think that's actually really interesting because um, I think that we both sort of trained in a similar time under similar people that had similar approaches even, I think, uh, to uh, tibial plateaus. I, you know, trained at WashU with Dr. Gardner, who had, you know, published one of the, you know, the earlier studies that you were referencing. Um, how does this study change what you do now, though? Yeah, I think it, um, you know, in residency, we would get MRIs on every tibia plateau fracture, and a lot of it was to gather information because, um, you know, we weren't sure uh, what these injuries, these soft tissue injuries, how they're going to affect these, these patients' outcomes. And so, um, you know, the saying, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and so we wanted to get as much information as we could. And uh, I think um, knowing these results, I think, um, you can be comfortable not getting an MRI as a routine for tibial plateau fractures. Um, and, and as long as intraoperatively after the bony fixation, um, a ligamentous exam is done and it's found to be stable, then you can be comfortable that uh, a lot of these other injuries don't necessarily need to be uh, treated acutely um, during the bony fixation. So I think that's the general take-home message and how it affects the way we uh, care for patients with these injuries.
Have you, just out of curiosity, have you come across in your early practice anybody that's needed either cruciate reconstruction or collateral reconstructions as a maybe early or delayed procedure? Yeah, we've had, you know, I think there are, there are a subset of patients um, uh, with these injuries that involve the fracture dislocation subset that I think uh, it's still important to uh, have a high index of suspicion for uh, a preoperative, uh, maybe getting a preoperative MRI and then following that through with regards to um, uh, acute uh, soft tissue reconstruction. We'll often collaborate with some of our sports colleagues for that decision making as well as some shared decision making with the patient regarding that. Um, but uh, I think that subset of the fracture dislocation uh, injuries are important to um, have a have a um, maybe a different a slightly different protocol in terms of the thresholds for getting an MRI um, in those patients. But otherwise, uh, sticking to this uh, routine that was described in this paper, where you uh, examine the patient, you know, uh, intraoperatively after the osseous fixation uh, to ensure ligamentous stability, have not had any uh, issues with that so far. Yeah, I, I've sort of had the same uh, experience, unless it was a frank fracture dislocation. Um, do you think there's any follow-up study that needs to be done for uh, this, or is this sort of the final say in um, you know ligamentous injuries around the knee with uh, plateau? Yeah, no, I sh for sure. Uh, I think there's a lot of follow-up studies that could be done. Uh, I think this is just really the tip of the iceberg again, to just, just to try to understand all this information and uh, how it could affect uh, the way we. we you know, treat uh, patients with these injuries, but I think um, focusing on a subset of patients with the fracture dislocation uh, injury pattern would be one important um, uh, study to move forward with uh, in terms of whether or not those patients truly need an MRI uh, or, um, and or uh, treating those soft tissue injuries acutely. So I think that would be one interesting study. And, you know, uh, I think with this study, you know, our, our patient numbers weren't, uh, uh, very high, and I think uh, potentially with a larger group of patients um, um, and a higher incidence of these injuries or a higher proportion of these injuries could have, could could affect outcomes or even following these patients longer term. These are a minimum of 12 months outcomes, and certainly we know that these injuries uh, can evolve to having uh, future problems in the longer term, five, 10 years out. And so I think having longer follow-up could also uh, be relevant in, um, uh, for future studies as well. You know, looking back on it, um, is there anything that you would like to do differently? Um, I think obviously the protocol is driven by your mentors and things like that, but uh, if you had the chance to go back and redesign the study, would you do something different? Um, you know, I think the, the main thing is, um, I think one of the things we could do now is our, change our outcomes a bit. I think we have uh, some outcomes that are, um, some of the patient reported outcomes that I think are, are better now with, uh, um, in terms of the ceilings and, and uh, things that we can detect differences on. And so I think um, always trying to improve uh, our clinical outcomes and what they can detect is, is important. I think that could be changed with the, with the study. Although at the time, I don't, I don't think many of those outcomes were as developed as they are now. Um, but uh, otherwise, I think um, uh, for what we were trying to show, um, I think this uh, was hopefully useful. Again, just at the tip of the iceberg to um, start to really try to understand what these soft tissue injuries are um, that come along with tibia plateau fractures and uh, how they should be uh, treated. And so um, I think uh, there's still a lot of work to be done in this area, but uh, this at least helps uh, get some direction on where to go. Yeah, I mean, I will say that I think that at the time that this study came out, I think that having any PROs, certainly in a retrospective fashion, is really, really kind of impressive to me that, um, you know, you had the foresight to you know, collect those. And I think that, you know, it speaks to the, the brilliance of, uh, you know, your program and, and uh, Dr. Lorch and things like that. So. Yeah, for sure. Uh, emphasize that as well. You know, he would always, you know, emphasize that seeing these patients at six, 12 months out and uh, seeing some limitations they have with either with stiffness or some residual pain, some dysfunction uh, and figuring out why that's the case. You know, why can't we get people back to truly 100% function? Uh, so he was always on the lookout for for those uh, opportunities to improve uh, these outcomes, uh, especially in the six to twelve month mark when you really uh, see patients plateau in their functional recovery. And so, um, you know, he was very much a proponent of collecting these outcomes in every patient that he had, no matter what injury they had, so that uh, we could retrospectively look at some uh, some different things and uh, try to improve uh, what we're doing. 
Great. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time. It's been a pleasure catching up and uh, going over uh, some of the, the work that you've done in your uh, previous training. And um, we'll look forward to uh, talking again soon, I think. All right. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate right. it. All right. Everybody get a chance to turn their videos on that will be participating in this section. As Dr. Cherney mentioned in the chat, Dr. Warner and Dr. Schottel were both authors of the final paper and kind of grew up in the department where access to MRI was, say, maybe a little different than in other practices. And so they have a unique perspective in uh, taking the, the kind of longitudinal continuity of this concept and applying it to their own practices now outside of that, that sphere. So I'll start with kind of a question that Dr. Warner alluded to in his, in his answering of the questions is that uh, if, do you have an indication then for MRI? And I'll extend this to Dr. Schott as well, coming from a similar background, is there one of these that you see is like, okay, that one, that one, that one gets an MRI. And at what point in the preoperative workup do you, you get it? Or is it a, is it a post-op thing? Where, what kind of, what do you use? That is, when do you use it? And then when in the progress do you get it? Yeah, I can probably start with that. I mean, I, I very uh, rarely uh, obtain MRIs in a lot of my acute tibial plateau fracture patients. I think what was already mentioned is that maybe with uh, patients with uh, pretty significant fracture dislocations, that that might be a time to obtain an MRI. If, if, if that is going to be kind of the course, and that's what I'm going to be doing, probably, you know, in consultation with some of my uh, sports medicine colleagues, probably get an MRI after an external fixator has been placed and we've gotten some uh, length and alignment and uh, uh, st skeletal stability kind of uh, reestablished. Yeah, I agree with all that. I mean, um, I think there are a certain subset of, of patients that warrant uh, a preoperative MRI or at least an MRI after temporizing external uh, fixed replication, um, but it's certainly my, the minority uh, at this point. There was a couple of questions from the audience about, well, if, if you, uh, if you, if you found Dr. Warner in your study that not addressing the soft tissue injury didn't necessarily affect the outcome, has that changed your practice on performing an arthrotomy? Is there a role for intraoperative arthroscopy? That was a couple of questions. That is, is it worth looking for then if we know that it may not direct the outcome? Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, um, Every, every injury is different. And I think uh, a protocol for all two plateau fractures uh, uh, would be difficult to, to make. And so I think every injury you have to treat uh, differently based upon the injury characteristics um, and some of the uh, uh, CT findings. But um, there's been a few studies that have looked at arthroscopy um, for diagnosis as well as a treatment of uh, two plateau fractures. And um, there's some interesting data from, from those studies. But in general, I think uh, from those things that we've done with MRI, the, um, for the most part, a clinical exam and, and using the injury x-rays to really assess uh, what the, uh, the fracture pattern is and what the uh, instability is of the knee joint um, is, is probably the most important factor to decide whether or not to, to move forward with any further evaluation of the soft tissues. And that could be either arthroscopy or MRI. Um, I think uh, arthroscopy certainly could be a useful modality to, to assess those injuries if you have the expertise and the equipment readily available. Hi, I'm Mike Tellerico here. I was going to ask, um, do you see a role for, or what injury patterns do you look for to make a medial arthrotomy? Um, and if you could talk about when you would ever make a medial sum of this for arthrotomy, and what do you look for and why would you do it? Yeah, so I think um, any any fractures where you have articular displacement of the medial uh, joint, uh, it's important to directly visualize those um, 
for getting the reduction as anatomic as possible. Um, so I think a submuscular arthrotomy in those instances is important. Um, those are not very common, but when they do uh, present themselves, I think a, a direct visualization of the articular surface for uh, reduction purposes is important. Um, otherwise, um, uh, not routinely making a submuscular arthrotomy on the medial side. I think on the lateral side, as was mentioned previously, uh, the amount of articular involvement as well as the meniscal injuries on that side is uh, much more common. Uh, so I think that is uh, much more commonly done and routinely done for most tibia plateau fractures. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I think, you know, obviously laterally, there's going to be more depression. And so I think, you know, in every case, performing a submeniscal arthrotomy laterally, looking at the meniscus and then helping to just visually see your uh, uh, reduction of the depressed fragments. You know, immediately, I, I don't see as much articular depression. I mean, there are cases, and that's certainly when I would think about doing an arthrotomy. But a lot of times it seems like the medial injury is, is more kind of a, a uh, undepressed kind of more split fragment that usually I can get some sort of decent cortical read on and not have to uh, create an arthrotomy and, and directly look at it. So a little more rare, I think on the medial side, obviously. Do you ever find yourself with you, if you're using a primary approach to the medial side, do you ever make a counter incision for a lateral approach to do the submeniscal arthrotomy laterally just to knowing that there's a high incidence of potential lateral soft tissue injury, do you often make that counter incision? And if so, uh, what are your reasoning or what do you look for? Yeah, I, I certainly do. I mean, I, I see a lot of Schatzker four kind of ski related injuries. And I think as Dr. Gardner had alluded to in his talk, you know, a lot of times those kind of medial fragments will extend into the lateral joint line. And I think there is a high incidence of uh, the meniscus kind of being pulled down into that fracture. And so, you know, a lot of times it may not be necessarily for an articular reduction, but certainly can be seen. But uh, even for my medial fractures, where I'm going to be kind of anaglide plating medially, I'll still typically go laterally uh, to see the reduction, look at the meniscus, and maybe even apply some sort of brim plate or shorter plate just to get some sort of subchondral screws right at the joint line. Yeah, I think those, that's a really good point. And I think using the fracture morphology as a clue as one of the follow-up studies that Dr. Gardner did to the study that was presented is important. I think that can be applied um, not just for lateral split depression plateaus, but for all plateaus and using those clues that you have from the injury x-rays to predict uh, what soft tissue injuries they may have. And those Shaskar fours where you have uh, lateral articular involvement, but the lateral cortical uh, area is intact are the, are the ones that uh, have a higher incidence of lateral uh, meniscal injuries that need to be addressed. There's another question from the audience that's come up a couple of times. Uh, so I think we're, we're kind of distinguishing the fracture dislocations from the, the more axial load types as ones that we have a higher threshold for thinking about the soft, injury, in, soft tissue injury affecting the outcomes. And you did mention that specifically in the discussion, uh, Dr. Warner, but uh, remind me if there was a subset where you pulled out the fracture dislocations as question part one, and then question part two in the fracture dislocations where we're seeing uh, an ACL disruption either by evidence of laxity or tibial eminence involvement. How often or what threshold do you use to address that? Or I think the counter is that they all get stiff anyway, and a lot of people aren't complaining of laxity. So, so those two questions, sorry for the reverse del delivery there. Yeah, great questions. Uh, first question, uh, we did not differentiate between fractious locations in that initial series. The, the numbers were on the relatively small side. And so I think to get meaningful numbers of a subset of fractious locations, we didn't uh, have those, but I think that would be a, a great follow-up uh, study to really uh, look at uh, those specific uh, injuries uh, and the associated soft tissue uh, uh, injury components to them. Um, second question, um, with an associated ACL uh, injury, I think um, using an algorithm of uh, examining the knee for any ligamentous laxity after the osseous fixation has been done is an important. Um, that being said, as you alluded to, and as, as uh, others have alluded to, typically the uh, post-operative course of these patients is uh, knee stiffness as opposed to knee instability. Uh, and so um, I think even with a, a small amount of laxity, uh, uh, that can be treated effectively in a brace. Uh, it's rare to have uh, instability uh, in the uh, in the midterm follow-up period, and so I think um, 
uh, that's less less likely to happen. But again, I think if you have a clinical suspicion for it and there's any concern on your intraoperative exam, uh, you know, consultation with a sports colleague or or um, or, or a close follow up with the patient regarding that would, would be important. Yeah, that's something I've always kind of thought about looking at these tibial uh, eminence fractures and just thinking about trying to somehow get a screw into it. And there's certainly techniques of creating tunnels and suture fixation of it. And that's why I think, you know, our, our paper was important just in, in showing that, you know, you can be somewhat of a nihilist, not to say that, you know, you, you should be in every case and certainly should have a high ind index of suspicion and continue to look for it. But you know, I think for a lot, a lot of times, you know, as we said, and we've already talked about these patients get stiff. And so you don't, you may not need to be as aggressive as, you know, we thought you might once have to have been. So um, certainly something to continue to think about, but I think more and more have been kind of staying away from it. For patients after you perform the osseous fixation and you do a strex examination of the knee, um, how often do you find yourselves bracing uh, or using some other uh, type of modality to provide extra stability? And if so, what is your protocol for those patients usually? I know it can depend on where you feel laxy or where you don't, but um, what is your usual kind of follow-up protocol for patients that you brace or immobilize post-operatively after plateau fixation? Yeah, uh, it'll depend on the patient factors as well as the injury characteristics in terms of a, a brace uh, wearing. I think if um, I don't feel like the patient is able to protect uh, themselves if they're obtended and, and uh, intubated and uh, in the ICU, then I'm uh, and we're going to be able to keep a close eye on their soft tissues. I'm more inclined to use a, a brace for those uh, patients to alert uh, other people that are taking care of them that they have an injury to that extremity. Um, uh, but in general, I think. Uh, with, with solid fixation, I think bracing is uh, certainly a, an option, but not necessarily a requirement. Uh, if they are braced, it's uh, unlocked for range of motion unless there's any sort of uh, involvement of the extensor mechanism in a separate tibia tubercle component or something like that. Yeah, I, I must admit, I, I still brace all of my plateaus or a majority of them. I mean, and maybe I shouldn't be, and maybe just like tourniquet use, it's something I'll kind of start to do less and less of as I kind of move on. Uh, you know, all my distal femurs, I typically don't brace at all, you know, for my plateaus, a lot of them, especially with depression, I'm just trying to, you know, protect some sort of varus valgus moment to the knee. And so I still will brace them, um, but try to kind of get them going with motion. But I don't know, maybe going forward, I'll start to do it less and less. Thank you. Do you, and for patients, I know training institutions that I was at, we were not routinely obtaining preoperative MRIs. How often do you, if you haven't received, gotten one before definitive fixation, are you ordering one after? And then how are you taking that information and how aggressively are you, you know, acting on the findings of partial or incomplete or complete tears? And I guess kind of in general, what is your role for the post-operative MRI? I, I haven't really had one yet, to be honest with you. I mean, for the most part, it, it hasn't really been an issue with any sort of... Uh, ligamentous laxity or instability. I mean, I, I just, I haven't had a patient yet where I've had to go back and obtain an MRI and kind of refer to one of my sports colleagues. So I, I haven't had that situation yet. Yeah, I think the, if you think about the challenges of that as well, if you have all the uh, internal fixation in place, obtaining an MRI that is reliable is, uh, is challenging. And so I think that's something to keep in mind. If you have any suspicion pre-op, preoperatively, for example, in these fracture location subset of uh, patients, um, it's definitely worthwhile to get that before you have internal fixation in close proximity to the knee, uh, which will certainly create scatter and artifact and uh, cloud that uh, MRI picture. So I think that's an important point uh, to try to get it before you have internal fixation. Um, but otherwise, uh, I think the, the, re the results are not as reliable. Um, and in, in terms of partial or complete tears, um, you know, the study that we looked at was just complete tears just to make a more homogenous group of patients uh, to, to follow. Um, but presumably with the results from the complete tears showing um, what we showed, um, I think the partial tears can be less concerned about uh, in terms of residual instability uh, and follow-up. Awesome. I have one Thank parting you question for the panelists. I'm sure all, all parties can weigh in. Uh, one of the questions from the audience, uh, post-op weight bearing. So don't need to expound necessarily on anything specifically. I would say mine is usually eight to 10 weeks uh, looking for bony consolidation. I'll get an X-ray at that point and will allow them to progress weight bearing. 
if I see clear consolidation of the metadiaphysis. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, go ahead. I'll, skip, I'll hop at once. I'll, I'll, I'll roll call. Dr. Sherney? I'm usually a little more conservative. It's usually closer to 12 weeks for me. Dr. Shuttle? Uh, I've been kind of decreasing. I mean, it obviously depends on the amount of depression and in, in their bone quality, but uh, six to 12 weeks, somewhere in there. Dr. Warner? Yeah, I agree with that. I think, uh, again, a, a unicondylar uh, plateau is, is different than a bicondylar uh, plateau with metadiaphyseal dissociation. And so I think uh, and bone quality is going to be different. Um, and so I think um, in general for the, the, the worser varieties, the, uh, the more severe varieties of these injuries, 12 weeks, but uh, I think for some of the more simpler injuries, I think less uh, is also viable. And I think there's some studies going on now that uh, will probably shift that, uh, that weight bearing uh, length uh, to start weight bearing patients in a shorter time period. And Dr. Tallarico, would you take us home? Oh, um, I would agree with that I, based on patient characteristics, fracture morphology, and expectation for what they need and if they have other uh, associated injuries to other extremities. But primarily the shortest end would be six. I usually try to get people to eight weeks um, if compliant with that. But I would say that's probably my average is eight weeks. I just think it's also hard to tell people for three months or a quarter of the year to not use their extremity. Um, so I've kind of moved to two months despite training in uh, places that recommended close to 12 weeks. So. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the audience for participating one and offering up some really great questions and to the panelists and the authors who stuck around to answer them. I'll remind everybody that link will come out. We're looking for feedback. This is pretty early. If you found it useful, have any additional topics that you would like to see discussed, specific papers even, we're open to any suggestions. Uh, the next two of these will be in December and January, we'll be doing humeral shaft fractures and calcaneal fractures, and those are in the works as we speak. And then the CME will come after the questionnaire. Thanks again, everybody.